for Krimer Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba, financial journalist and author Robert Gentle, joins me to discuss his memoir titled The Scholarship Kids, Dream Big, Fly High. Hi, Robert. Hi. So can you tell us about your inspiration for painting this memoir and how a Boeing 707 triggered a love of aircrafts in you and your twin brother, Michael? Well, first, the inspiration for the whole story um, actually came uh, when we got to France. I know I'm jumping ahead in the narrative, but within a couple of months of my brother and me actually arriving in France, the sheer wonder of that actually happening, it felt so surreal. I mean, all the, the things that had happened to bring us up to that point, and I said, you know, one day I'm going to write a story. I'm going to write this entire thing and put it down on paper. So that was the inspiration. It was just the, the unusual nature of, of the story. It, it, it was a feel-good story. It had interest in twists and turns, and it had a satisfying conclusion. And I said, I have to put this down on paper. So the wish had always been there. The inspiration had always been there. And then when lockdown came during COVID, I suddenly found I had a lot of time on my hands. So I said, you know what? I've got all this time on my hands. I've always wanted to do the story. Now's the time. So that's, that, that explains how the inspiration and, and, and how and when I decided to write the book. Um, as for the um, Boeing 707 incident, that was interesting. It was a pivotal moment in our lives. Because okay. I still remember um, it was a, a weekday evening. And in our family, we read a lot. Uh, our family always gathered around in the, in the living room at night. And we all read the newspaper. And my mother had seen this article about one of South African Airways' new Boeing 707s. And she read the article and she saw the photograph and she said, this looks amazing. We've got to go and see this. So the next day, my dad drives us all in the car. We drive to um, Cape Town International Airport, or DF Milan, as it was known back then. And we see this massive machine. And my, what a sight. I mean, it just blew us away. The size of the thing. We'd never seen anything so big. And it was shortly before its departure to London. So it was just all in all an, an awe-inspiring uh, experience. So yeah, the, the dream was born that day. And can you tell us about your inner plane sporter that you and Michael discovered? <laughs> that was when we were in, uh, when, when we'd moved to Zambia. My, mm -hmm. uh, my, my parents got uh, teaching positions in Zambia. So when we were about maybe 10 years old, we moved from Cape Town in South Africa to Lusaka in Zambia, where my parents were high school teachers. And I remember in, in, in the house that we were allocated, we had this lovely big uh, furnished house in this lovely suburb. But the main thing was that it was under the flight path of the aircraft coming into land at the municipal airport. So, I mean, several times an hour, you'd see these planes coming vroom, over, the, over the house on their way to the airport. And my brother and I became what we call plane spotters. We would like listen for the sound and we'd run outside and say, plane, plane. And then we'd just love seeing the planes. And eventually we'd actually drive out to the airport, climb through a fence and sit at the edge of the runway, which we weren't supposed to do. That was illegal, but nobody ever caught us. And we'd sit there and we'd watch the planes coming into land. It was fantastic. <laughs> Briefly talk to us about the rejections you received when trying to apply for scholarships. But you received the good news that you and Michael had been awarded the United Nations Development Project Scholarship to study mechanical engineering at the University of Zambia. Yeah. Um, you know, the thing is, when you have a big dream, and, and our dream to, to, to become engineers and work in av aviation well, was a big dream, but big dreams are expensive. And... Bear in mind, there were two of us. I had an identical twin brother, Michael. So it's expensive enough for parents to, to, to kind of fund one child through university and even then, but two and, and an expensive course like engineering. So we, we realized very early on that we needed to get outside financial assistance. So we thought, where do you go? Scholarships. So we basically went on a scholarship hunt when we, when we graduated from high school. Or maybe even it was slightly before when we were in, mm. in Form 5 or in matric year for want of a bit. And we just knocked on doors. We went for interviews. But each and every time we, we hit the, these walls of objections. The first objection was, well, um, there are two of you in the family. Mm. You know, we don't award scholarships to two members of the family. Um, well, you want, to, you want to go very far. You want to go overseas. No, these scholarships are only for, for local universities. There was always some, some problem. And I remember when we tried to get into South African Airways, now bear in mind, this was the apartheid era. 
and South African Airways, in fact, the whole aviation industry was essentially for whites only. Mm. But you know what? My brother and I were naive and optimistic, said, what the hell? Let's try anyway. So we wrote a letter to South African Airways and said, can we come there? They were fairly polite about it. They said, yeah, thanks for your application. But, you know, we only accept pe trained people from the Air Force. So that other obstacle was obviously mm. the race, if you read between the lines. So we had all these obstacles, but fortunately we persisted. And in one of our interviews, the scholarship officer actually told us, have you tried the UNDP? We'd never heard of the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program. So we thanked her. We fixed an appointment at the UNDP. And there, all of a sudden, everything just, you know, when everything falls into place and all the lights are green. <laughs> so it was perfect. And we got this very full and generous scholarship to study mechanical engineering. Very grateful. And can you tell us about your emotions when you first boarded the London-bound VC10 after watching passengers boarding it 10 years before? Oh, that was, that was amazing. That, that experience is etched in our memories because, as you correctly say, when my brother and I were growing up, we'd often go to Lusaka International Airport. Our parents would go there in the evenings. They'd sit up in the bar and have a drink and a cigarette, and my brother and I would take our Coca-Colas, go down to the viewing deck, and we'd watch the VC-10s being prepared for the flight to London. It was a British Overseas Airways Corporation, BOAC VC-10. It later became British Airways. Anyway, we used to be so enraptured. We'd watch this plane being prepped for departure, and it was just an awe-inspiring sight, and we'd wait until the plane took off, and we'd see it climbing into the night sky until it was just a little dot. So that memory was anchored in our, in our minds and our hearts. And we always said, you know, one day that's going to be us. We're also going to fly on a VC-10. And sure enough, about 10 years later, we had an opportunity to fly to Johannesburg on a VC-10 that belonged to Air Malawi. So the dream that we had always had in our hearts yeah. suddenly came true and we went on board this aircraft. And it was just magical. You know, we sat there, we watched the flying control surfaces, we took off. And after dinner was served, we actually asked the stewardess if we could go into the, on the flight deck, which is great. So we actually went and we met the pilots, we chatted, an amazing experience. Tell us more about your French immersion program in Toulouse. Ah, the French immersion program. That was interesting because the weird thing is we, we didn't really need the immersion program because my brother and I had fallen in love with French when we were at high school. And we'd really worked and worked and we'd read books and watch movies and listen to the radio. And we, were, we, we had a very good level of French even before we got to France, for, um, after we'd been granted the French scholarship. But anyway, so we, we, we got there and, and, and to our great surprise, we were told that the first year would be spent in Toulouse in the south of France in a, on a, for an immersion program. And initially we were a bit disappointed because oh, this kind of puts our plans back for a year. But, you know, everything works out for the best. And it was actually a, a great quote unquote setback because mm -hmm. what it meant is that because of our high level of French, we didn't really need to work that hard. So it was an easy year for us academically. And the other foreign students who were with us, they had a lot of work to do. They found it hard. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, for us, it was just one long holiday. We'd be visiting castles and going to the you know, French monuments, eating out in restaurants. It was a great year. And talk to us more on how Michael, after working in engines for bailing a, a month, spotted an opportunity to improve the efficiency of an operational procedure known as the trim balance. Oh, the famous trim balance. <laughs> you know, my brother and I are very curious. I, I don't know <laughs> if it's a thing with twins or whatever. We're always kind of on the lookout. Oh, what's interesting? What can we do here? Anyway, so I was, this is, this is when we were working for UTA Airlines, mm. the big French airline. So I was in the, I think, the airframes department, and my brother had been assigned to the engines department. And uh, he used to watch the engines being balanced. You know, jet engines are very complex, and they've got blades and stuff. And just like a motor car engine needs to be balanced, the aircraft engines need to be balanced. And my brother used to watch this process taking place outside with this big, huge jet. And he said, God, this wastes a lot of fuel. Why are they starting up? taking readings and then manually calculating mm. the new balance. He says, I, I can do that with a computer because we had started computer programs. So he said, I'm going to computerize this process. He was quite excited. So I remember that weekend he went home and he spent the whole weekend working on the little <laughs> portable computer and he wrote, he wrote a program that computerized all the calculations. So instead of taking, I don't know, an hour or so to, you know, work out the new balance parameters, you just input the... Um, 
the various values into the computer and it worked it out in seconds. So yeah, he was, he was quite proud of it. <laughs> and lastly, Robert, what are you hoping people take away after reading your book? <laughs> That's a philosophical question. <laughs> Oh, there's so many there's so many ways you can interpret the story. Um, I was actually thinking about this actually on the way. I wonder if anyone asks me this question, what would be my answer? And I think I know what the answer is. My answer would simply be no matter how bad things seem in your life, be positive and optimistic because somehow they always work out. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds kind of trite and naive, but that's, that, that's been my experience and my brother's. It was an experience that defined us. So it's really a belief in, in, in the fact that for us, at least, things would work out. So things are, look bleak. Don't worry. It's going to get better. That's the takeaway. Thanks a lot, Robert. Pleasure. That was Robert Gentle speaking to Crema Media's Polity about the scholarship kids.